Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. In today's episode, really fascinating company. Uh, this founder actually came across my radar when I found out about her on Instagram through Our Future HQ's uh, uh, shorts reel. Our Future's uh, covers usually a lot of really interesting companies in tech, not so often in healthcare. And so here's the story behind uh, Catherine Cross, our guest, and her company, Anja Health. So first, what caught my attention was the fact that uh, former Coinbase uh, CEO and, of course, a uh, really well-known guy on Twitter, uh, Balaji Srinivasan, invested in her. The founder of Reddit, Alex Sohanian, invested in her. And so usually you don't hear these kind of names in investing in health tech companies. The second thing was, what a wild idea it is. So essentially, um, Catherine has a very tragic story. Her brother uh, ended up with cerebral palsy and passed away later on uh, in his life. And it could have been prevented had they had access to his cord blood, uh, essentially the cord and placental blood from the time of his birth because of its, its richness in stem cells. Right, And so Catherine, inspired by the death of her brother, started this company, which is a subscription-based company, to send a kit to parents so that the cord blood, the placenta, and the cord are collected within, uh, I believe, 48 or 72 hours, sent to their laboratories, in which case they take them and cryogenically freeze them for a subscription uh, plan that uh, goes on, I think, for about 20 years. and. If you ever need to access it, if your child or one of your children um, has a disease or something that can be uh, essentially treated with stem cells, they have the cord, blood, and the placental tissue on hand, cryogenically frozen for you to do that. I thought it was such a wild business model, but more importantly, it has a great story because Catherine is motivated to make the subscription-based uh, business model affordable for people in low-income households, uh, people of color, you know, people that normally would not have access to these kind of things because uh, because they're generally really expensive. So great episode, fascinating founder, and, and I'm really excited to have more uh, founders like Catherine on the show. Before we hop into it, a couple of uh, resources I want to point the audience to. If you're a startup founder and you're struggling to get traction, you're struggling to get awareness among investors and early adopters, we at the State of Med Tech can help. We work with founders every single month to help you tune up your messaging, get your LinkedIn profiles looking good, and more importantly, do the right things based on content and video to attract both investors and early adopters. Here is a story of Moon Surgical. It's a robotics company out of France who raised $31 million in their Series A. Six months prior to that, nobody knew who they were, but they worked with us. Here's what their CEO, Ann Ostewitt, and their chief strategy officer, Jeff Alvarez, had to stay, say about the engagement. The results were amazing. The traffic that was driven to not just our company site, but also our personal sites, over 300% of what it typically was on a regular basis while we had the campaigns going. We know the results were being achieved, and that's why it's so great to work with Omar. The level of inbound interest we were getting was substantial, especially from investors. It has only been growing since then. So we've been leveraging Omar's work and what we learned from him continuously in the past two years. So for more information, please go to katibandco.com or just hit me up on LinkedIn and get a meeting with me. And finally, if you're in sales or let's say you're a founder and you're trying to find early adopters, data is so important because you have to find find out who does the most procedures for your device or perhaps where the prescribing behaviors are so you can identify the right people to adopt your product. The problem is most databases these days, a lot of them are great, but they cost so much money, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 a year. That's where Alpha Sophia can help you. Alpha Sophia is a company that I discovered that has an amazing platform that covers all these different data points from procedure volume, prescribing behavior, even looking at the societies a surgeon or physician attends. 
and looping in their social media handles. As you know, I'm a big believer and the data has shown how effective social media is to driving adoption with uh, physicians. They loop in their Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn handles. So you can try their platform today. Just head to Alpha Sophia. that's A-L-P-H-A-S-O-P-H-I-A.com forward slash Omar and you get three free searches. Plus, if you decide to use it with yourself or even your sales team, check out how low of a cost it is. It's only $300 a month. That's unbelievable. So go to alphasophia.com forward slash Omar to find out more. And now let's get on to our episode with Catherine Cross, CEO and founder of Anja Health. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, this is another women's health episode. A really interesting founder with a fascinating company. I was on Instagram and I was checking out. There's one page called Our Future HQ. They do a lot of uh, highlights of really interesting startups. Normally, they don't cover healthcare or medtech, but this founder uh, has a very interesting medtech company. I wanted to have her on. So Catherine Koss, founder and CEO of Anja Health. Catherine, thank you so much for joining the show. How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I'm at a WeWork in LA. Awesome. Fantastic. So let's talk about uh, Anja. So very simply put, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to your website here. So you talk about essentially, um, and I'm going to, I want to go read directly from the very first thing, very first thing on your website says, finally, affordable cord blood banking is here. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I, we just had our, you know, we just had a baby 15 months ago, but you know, we're going to plan on having kids in the future. (laughs) And so this is essentially, you know, you're trying to convince somebody like my wife that they should, you know, bank their, 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 their cord blood. Mm-hmm. What is that? Why would you want to do that? Um, for the OBGYNs who follow the show, they they know this uh, very well. But for our general listeners, like what what is this and why is that important? Yeah, well, so um, when the baby is born, the umbilical cord and placenta are really rich with stem cells. So that's specifically the blood inside of the umbilical cord, the cord itself, what we call the cord tissue, and then also the placenta. So they're all really rich resources for stem cells. Um, and it kind of makes sense, like the umbilical cord and placenta spend nine months creating life. So it would make sense that super regenerative cells are present in the umbilical cord and placenta. And essentially what folks have started to do in the past um, like 20 and 30 years is to actually freeze those stem cells, so freeze the umbilical cord and placenta um, in order to use for future disease treatment purposes. So freezing it very similar to how you would freeze eggs or sperm um, and then utilizing them in the future should you need a stem cell treatment. Um, Typically the most common use cases are cancers um, and multiple sclerosis, uh, different types of musculoskeletal disorders, um, heart disease, liver disease, things like that. So research is really quickly advancing in the area. Um, But yeah, cord blood banking is essentially the process of specifically banking stem cells from the cord blood, which is the blood inside of the umbilical cord. But we also do cord tissue and placenta banking, which is from the cord and placenta. Uh, What's your what's your background? How did you come up with this company and this idea? If you can kind of tell the origin story, I I have a lot of clinical questions I want to ask. But you know, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear like, what's your origin story? Like, where are you from? What did you study in school? And how the heck did you decide to start a company like this? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm from LA. Um, I started Anja Health because of my younger brother. So when I was three and he was one, he was in a near drowning accident that gave him cerebral palsy. Um, so prior to that, he was healthy. But then when he got diagnosed with cerebral palsy, my family began looking into treatments for it and found that stem cells from the umbilical cord, so cord blood, have been used in kids with cerebral palsy and have been able to improve motor and social skills in those kids. Um, so my family began looking for someone else's cord blood to use because we didn't have mine or my brother's, but it's pretty difficult to find a match if you're a person of color or mixed race um, because donors are generally found uh, via like ethnic matching because certain traits um, that are used for matching are inherited through ethnic groups. So. Um, and, and most donors are solicited in high income areas. So of course, with that, like donor pools tend to be skewed pretty white. So it was difficult for us to find a match. It's difficult if you're like really any group of color. Um, if you're black, for instance, the chances of finding a match are 29%. Um, and it can be even lower if you're mixed race. So even though we're half Chinese and half white, and I feel like that's a pretty common mix, we weren't able to find a match. Um, so my family has just always been really adjacent to the space. And then in uh, 2021, my brother passed away, or in 2022, early 2022. Um, so I was moved to, or wait, sorry, it was 20, yeah, 2021, early 2021. Um, and so I was moved to then start Anja Health because I wanted to do something 
in his memory that would have been able to impact him. So I named the company Andrew Health after him, um, and his name was Andrew. Wow, that's uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. It's like extremely difficult. It was was he the only sibling that you had? Yeah. Uh, and he was was your he was your younger or older brother? Yeah, younger. So he was two years younger. Wow, wow, that's like really really hard to hear. And um, <laughs> yeah, no, that, I got to take a sec. I wasn't expecting that. You know. When you when you developed the company, started it. Um, what were you doing before Anja? Yeah, I was a product designer at a company called Publicis Sapien. They're like a tech consultancy, um, and that was my first job out of college. Um, so, oh yeah, you you also asked where I went to school. I went to Wellesley College, um, which is a historically women's college, and still today, like uh, no cis men on campus. Um, so, uh, yeah. And I studied media arts and sciences, um, which is sort of like computer science and art. So my background has always kind of been in digital design, um, marketing, media, things like that. Um, and I've just always had an interest in healthcare because of the, the broad impact that it has. Fascinating. So, you know, you don't have like a, like a medical background, but you know, you're, you have this extremely sad and traumatic story. I mean, losing, losing a brother, uh, I don't, I can't imagine what that was like. And so that moved you enough to say that you're going to do something about it. So where do you start? Because I think a lot of people, they, they would, they, they would love to sort of start a company to solve a, an illness. A lot of people go into medicine because somebody in their family was afflicted with something. Right. So mm -hmm. how, how did you, how did that process, you know, get started for you? Yeah, well, I knew that um, cord blood banking would be an area that I could speak to because my family has always been really adjacent to the space because we were always trying to find a match for my brother. And um, it's just something that I've grown up knowing about. Um, so I feel like in that way, it was easier for me to take the first step, which was really setting up the supply chain. Like I already kind of had an idea of where I could find different supply chain partners. Um, and so it was it was kind of an easy step in that way. And it just kind of felt like this is, um, yeah, the right thing to do. Got it. So did you have to go through the FDA at all for any of this? Did you use a 510k clearance? Like what was the regulatory pathway look, look like for this? Yeah, well, our lab um, has to physically, that physically handles the stem cells. They are ABB accredited and aligned with FDA standards, but um, we actually don't because uh, anyone that is technically a part of the company never really physically handles any biological goods. Um, we're sort of like the front man um, for it. We have a contracted partner for our lab um, and they've been around for around 40 years. Um, so yeah, they have definitely aligned with all the regulations that they need, um, but we actually don't have to. I verify every year that that we don't have to have anything um, with like the ABB and um, and the FDA, and we are registered with the California Department of Health, but it's uh, essentially like unnecessary. Got it. Got it. Um... And, you know, so that, so that makes it a lot easier, at least like in terms of like developing an MVP and to date, how much have you guys raised to date? Um, a little over 5 million. Okay, great. And so you don't, you don't have any lab costs essentially, aside from just paying, paying the lab that you're partnered with a lot of the uh, money that you raised, uh, I would assume it's going to like public education and marketing. Is that correct? Um, yeah, we, we actually do use some of the venture towards uh, experimenting with different pricing options because one big thing for me was making sure that cord blood banking was accessible. Like it's typically perceived as something that's for the top 1%. So um, right. yeah, quite a few like upfront costs with our lab um, and just like processing a product in general, which is pretty typical for like D to C e-com. Um, and so, yeah, while we were experimenting with different pricing models, um, we did use some venture for that as well. Um, and even looked into death facilities and things of that nature. But, um, yeah, we have figured that out now with unit economics. Um, so now it is, yeah, mostly going towards, um, our marketing. Nice. Fantastic. Um, what, what was it like when you, uh, when you went to go raise money? I mean, who, you know, I'm, I'm, I know like raising money is like really, really exhausting. Um, but what were the things that you kind of learned and how did it, how did you grow during that process? Cause it is a brutal process. Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of think about it like dating. I think it's actually really similar to dating. Um, so it like really for instance, is. finding the right VCs, yeah. <laughs> it really is actually. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think a lot about it like that. Um, I think fundraising by Ryan Breslow, he's a controversial figure, but his, his literature is really good. I think that's a really solid guide, um, with fundraising and, um, yeah, I, I tried to find investors that I felt like were a good fit in the same way that like you try to find a life partner that's a good fit. So like with Alex Sohanian and Balji, for instance, like I was really, really keen on having them involved because I just like felt in my soul that if they heard my, my story, that they would get it. Um, because Alexis, his daughter is mixed race. He, I, I had once like heard that he had done cord blood banking before for, um, his daughter Olympia and, um he like has, he's a big advocate for parental causes like paternity leave and his wife was really outspoken about having a traumatic birth experience so all of these things kind of align where i knew that if he heard my story he would empathize with the end consumer and same thing with balji like he is typically known for his coinbase work but people forget that his background is in genetics and one of his first companies was a very large genetics company specifically geared towards um, prenatal genetic testing and he has tweeted many times about cord blood banking and the fact that stem cells are kind of a part of the future um, as many people in genetics believe so um same thing. Like I was just incessant about getting in touch with him and having him hear my story because I felt like he would understand. Fascinating. And uh, just for context, for a lot of the audience who doesn't know, Alexis Ohanian was the uh, founder of Reddit. Um, mm -hmm. So that's like, yeah. So I saw you, you raise money from him and you know, you have some really great investors around you. So it sounds like a lot of, uh, at least your fundraising was focused not on just getting the money, but getting people who who had a had a personal tie to the mission that you're trying to accomplish is that correct yeah yeah i wanted people that had media exposure because a lot of what i've been doing is media related um and who just understand like who can who can empathize with the end user in terms of um the pregnancy and birth journey um which you you would think more people do in silicon valley but um i think there are a lot of young men in vc who don't even know what a placenta is <laughs> so it was no, you're right. important yeah it was important to me that um that they did know that and yeah i was privileged enough to be able to have the luxury to to choose and like be selective about who i was reaching out to fantastic and you did end up going through yc i believe correct yeah Awesome. What, what was that? What was that? What was that like? I mean, what did you what did you enjoy about it? Would, would that be something you'd recommend to founders? Because I mean, getting grad graduating out of YC definitely helps uh, with your raise. It doesn't guarantee it, but it definitely helps. Um, what was that experience like? And what was your, what would your advice be to founders who might be considering that? Yeah, um, I mean, I really liked it. I think sort of similarly, like one of my partners was Serbi, who started her company at a similar age, was also a solo female founder, also geared towards women's health. Um, it was an ovarian cancer detection device, and she sold it to Medtronic. Um, so like similarly, someone that I felt would just understand my journey and be able to empathize with end users. She's also a mom. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed having that connection. Um, and yeah, I think one of my least favorite questions to get is like, should I do YC? It's kind of like, you should just apply and keep your options as open as possible. And, um, it will never hurt to be a part of like an elite tech community. Um, and yeah, I guess maybe elite is not the right word, but um yeah but it just never hurts to open up your network especially for someone like me like solo female founder um in healthcare which tends to be like a pretty legacy industry um i didn't go to an ivy league like i didn't really know what silicon valley was until like a couple years ago so um to me like any amount of equity is kind of worth that um because like yeah you won't you the the equity breakdown won't matter if you don't have a company that succeeds so you may as well at the early stage like take every chance you can got it yeah no i completely agree um let's talk about your about your product now um so the the concept here is essentially that when your baby is born if something god forbid were to happen in the future right uh whether it's uh, a neurodegenerative disease or anything at all right stem cells can be used to improve the, yeah. the, the outcome right and obviously what's better than stem cells is that your your own stem cells more specifically from you know uh cord banking right so yeah. what's the process so let's say i mean look my wife and i are gonna uh planning on having a baby next year okay cool <laughs> yeah and so 
my, you know, when I t get off this interview, I tell my wife about this, what would my wife do? What's the process? Yeah. Um, so around, I would say pretty much like as soon as you find out you're pregnant, I would recommend reserving a kit. We don't even send it out until you reach, um, seven months or around 30 weeks. So, um, you have the option to sort of like, why is that by the way? Um, just because it's something that like people need to bring to birth. So we don't want parents to just kind of have it sitting around or, and it gets oh, and lost. Misplaced it. Oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. That, yeah, that, so that helps um, increase customer success for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, around 30 weeks is when people begin to start thinking about birth. Also, like most, uh, a large majority of people deliver prior to their due date. So that's why I recommend just like planning as early as possible so that you don't forget. Um, but yeah, we will send a kit straight to your doorstep at around 30 weeks um, or later if you order past that point. Um, and you can basically keep the kit with you, bring it to birth, let your physician know that you have the kit. It contains all the tools that they need to collect the cord blood, cord tissue, and placenta, and you can choose to bank one, two, or three of them. Um, you only pay for what we receive in the lab. Um, and so, yeah, then afterwards you can fill out a quick pickup form or call our pickup line. We'll dispatch a courier within 12 hours or less to come and pick it up and bring it to our lab in New Jersey where the stem cells will be processed and frozen um, at negative 190 degrees Celsius with vapor nitrogen. So, um, yeah, that's the, the whole process. And then in the future, you can access these stem cells should you need them um, to whatever degree you need them and uh, like whatever dosage and things like that. Um, so you would work that out with a, a physician that is okay with administering a stem cell treatment. Interesting. And so essentially it's ordering, ordering the kit, uh, getting the kit, bring that to birth. And then as soon as uh, the birth is done, like you call, you call for pickup, you have a courier dispatch and they pick it up. So at what point, you know, uh, just from a business model standpoint, uh, the thing that, uh, that An Anja's and am I pronounced is Anja or Anja? I Anja. Yeah. Anja. The, the part that Anja's focused on is developing, you have your kits, which are developed. I'm, I'm guessing, is there anything proprietary about those kits? Uh, just our design. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, so the, yeah, so the main, the main thing here is just doing the, the, the public education around it and capturing those, those, those customers. Right. And yeah. so. The moment the kits you you capture the uh, the placenta the or you know and the and and the and the uh, is it cord blood is that the right way to put it yeah cord blood cord okay. tissue or placenta got it got it got it got it I went to medical school but sometimes I forget like is is there like a more clinical term and I try and always use that okay cord blood makes yeah. it easier um, perfect um, once you know now that you know that that facility in Jersey that's that's the uh, the uh, the, the, the laboratory partner that you guys had, how did you um, decide to go with that laboratory over, let's say others? Cause I would imagine there's, there are multiple options for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I was saying, since I've been kind of adjacent to the space for so long, like I sort of knew who to go to in a sense. Um, they're just like people that I've always known about growing up, like learning about the industry. Um, so yeah, or we're, we're, we're able to get in touch with like sooner. Um, so yeah, that's how I chose our lab. Also our, our lab director used to be an AABB um, accreditor. And so he, I knew would run a tight ship um, and the lab has been around for many years. So they've dispatched a lot of their own stem cells for um, stem cell treatment. So they just have a lot of experience in the space. So um, yeah, I knew that it would, it would be a good move to move forward with them. Got it. Got it. So after all this is done, then you essentially, you know, you store, you store the cells, you cryo freeze them essentially. Correct. And, you know, yeah. I'm just reading from your website. So essentially you, this, it says includes 20 years of storage. So can you walk us through like the pricing of it? Um, like what, what, what is it? What is a, what does a customer pay? You know, is it a one-time fee? Is there, is there like a subscription? How, how does that work? Yeah. So they pay $199 for the kit. Um, and then starting one month after birth, um, so not your due date, the actual birth date um, is when the subscription payments will start. Um, so it's a interest-free payment plan that we offer over eight years, but it covers 20 years of storage. So you get 12 free essentially. Um, and that's $49.79 or $99 a month, depending on if you choose one, two, or three of the cord blood, cord tissue, and placenta. Um, and then we have other payment options where you can choose to pay 20% upfront or pay 100% of it upfront for a 20% or 30% discount respectively. Um, so yeah, it just depends on like what works with your financials. Um, 
And so with that, I, yeah, I'm pretty proud of the fact that we're able to be accessible to not just the top 1%. Um, I mean, obviously the best healthcare is free, um, but until we can get insurance to cover preventative care, um, yeah, we're trying our best. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. And just, I mean, just for context, cause again, like even me being in the med tech space, I, I have no anchor for this. So, um, <laughs> You know, you mentioned that your your pricing plans goes from forty nine to ninety nine dollars a month, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's that's every month for eight years. But then once you complete that, that you you get twenty years of storage, right? That's what yeah. you're really buying. Okay. And so you can pay that up front. You can do it month to month. So the month to month option. How does this compare to the pricing model of let's say other uh, cord blood blood cord uh, banking uh, companies? Yeah, so it's about 30% more affordable. And also most others don't have payment plans per se. Like they typically- I was gonna say, I would imagine they want like a big lump sum payment yeah. upfront. And I think that's probably yeah. why it's only like a 1% thing, right? Right, right. Yeah, so most of them they require, yeah, lump sum upfront for like processing, shipping, things like that. Um, and then they have an annual fee for continued storage. So it ends up being pretty expensive and around like 1800 plus upfront um, and then like 400 a year, some kind of structure like that. Um, so it sort of varies, but like most of them are structured that way um, because it is, it is expensive to uh, ship a biological good. It's expensive to have cryopreservation very immediately. Um, and it's expensive to produce the kit and to process it um, and things like that. So I, I understand why the unit economics work out that way, but one of our goals was to try and have unit economics that are beneficial for lower income folks too. So um, yeah, we have been able to reach like folks that self-identify as having household income of less than 75K, um, which has been pretty promising. So um, yeah, I think most people don't educate lower income folks about cord blood banking because they don't think they can afford it. But I think that uh, choice should be left up to the parents. Got it. Got it. Um, and in terms of like the kit, I mean, do, does, is a patient able to make the decision in terms of what they banked? Does that, in, that, does that have an impact on the price? Uh, walk, walk us through that. Yeah. So it's um, $49.79 or $99 a month, depending on if they do one, two or three. And the uh, parents only pay for what we receive at the lab. So we do send like certain kits with certain items if they sign up for all three, but if we only get two of them, then we'll only charge them for two of them. So um, I would suggest signing up for all three and then you kind of never know what happens. Like sometimes the placenta is infected or like gets taken away. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would suggest just doing all three just in case um, so that you have the, the tools to really capture stem cells from them. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, you know, because we, uh, we, we publish on... Um both uh spotify and youtube i do want to bring this up because i do love your pricing yeah. i mean i like i like the transparency of your pricing uh pricing page but also the fact that it's like it, it's very easy to understand so here we go so essentially you have you, you so essentially what what makes it goes up in price is that whether you do cord blood cord blood and cord tissue or cord blood cord mm -hmm. tissue because you're essentially paying for more space right, right. and then you have these three options is pay later, flex pay, and then pay now. Um, mm -hmm. And so essentially, like if if somebody just wanted to uh, do the full package and pay for 20 years of storage and everything, that's $6,500, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And I can see what's nice is that especially for, you know, there are families out there who have uh, genetic diseases in their family. They have a family history of things. And so they know that there's a higher chance that you know, their kid might have something. And I, I think that this makes it a lot more affordable for those families, especially in the flexible side, you know? Right. Yeah. We actually have a partner, uh, partnership with billion to one, another YC company. And one of our medical advisors is their head of business development, um, an OBGYN named Dr. Chang and billion to one will actually cover the first year of cord blood banking. If you test with them, um, for certain diseases that stem cells can treat. So one, really Oh, popular, that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so one really so cool. Yeah, like sickle cell anemia, for instance, um, cord blood has been used um, and is really promising for sickle cell anemia. So um, that's an option. And yeah, if you you can use it in the first year, potentially, especially if it's for a sibling or something like that. So um, yeah, I would definitely recommend that if you are doing genetic testing and things like that. 
Fascinating. Um, the, 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 the other company that you partner with, uh, what's the name of it? Billion to One. Billion to One. And their main, their main business is, 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 is genetic uh, testing? Yeah, pre- yeah, prenatal genetic testing specifically. So very similar to Baji's company that I mentioned. Uh, so that's really interesting because essentially uh, they figured out their, their, session, their customer acquisition costs. And I guess their thing is like if they, if they do that, then they're willing to like cover. Oh, that's actually very smart. I like that. <laughs> for very sure. interesting so you know how long the company's been around and just been long around for how long now since 2021 since 2021 so it's still really really early but at this point mm-hmm. i mean have you do you have any like uh, patient testimonials have you met some of the families yeah. i mean what, what can you tell us oh, about yeah. the about the end user that you know that you yeah, t- yeah, tell, yeah. tell us about that <laughs> yeah um a lot of end users are through social media. Um, some of them are investors of mine. Some of them are like friends, siblings, or um, yeah, like uh, partners, uh, like affiliate partners with us, their family members, or the affiliate partners themselves. So yeah, it's really anyone who has touched our story and is pregnant. Even like the how you found me that our future pod, someone um, got one of our kits just off of seeing that. So. Yeah, I think it's just anyone that's particularly forward thinking about their family's health um, and thinks about preventative care and is really interested and uh, is able to comprehend sort of the like science of the future and preventative care around stem cells. Um, so, yeah, it's it's it, it really varies. But, um, yeah, it's been like a, a wide variety of people. So. You know, what's what's interesting about the business is that um, in in a way, in a way, you're kind of selling like a, a form of insurance. Would you is, mm-hmm. is that am I wrong in saying that? Yeah. Or would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so really tough business to be in. Right. Um, what have you found to be the most effective way to convey the education around this? Um, and, you know, if you want to get into specifics of channels, um, you know, like, yeah, how do how do you reach your end end patient? So in this case. It's going to be either the mother or like, you know, or the father, right? Mm-hmm. Depending on who it is. How do you reach that person? How do you find a way to educate them? And, you know, of course, like, you know, having a baby is expensive, you know, just the first year, like all the stuff. I mean, I, you know, aside from expensive, I mean, I can't tell you how much time I spend just researching car seat, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. To, yeah, so get parents to say, hey, you're going to, you should buy a $200 kit. And then it, it at the mm-hmm. very cheapest, it's going to be like $49 a month for, for eight years, right? How do you educate that pay, that parent to kind of prioritize that? Yeah, I think the most effective has been short form content um, that's also really comprehensive. Like, I think it's a mix of hearing like my family story with my brother. We weren't able to find a match. We wish we did. It wasn't even a genetic disease. He got cerebral palsy from a freak accident. And then suddenly we were in a position where my family had wished that they had stored stem cells. Um, so I think it's just like really knowing someone that could have used it. Um, And then also like the next question from parents is like, well, how does it all work? So then I typically will like show our kit, unbox it, um, just make people like really tangibly understand what it is that they're ordering. Um, so yeah, it's about, um, I, I wish I had the, the kit with me. It's in my car, but it's about this big. Um, and it contains like the main crux of it is the cord blood bag, which just looks like a normal blood bag. You stick the needle into the umbilical cord vein and collect it there. Um, then you cut off six to 10 inches of the cord, place that in a small jar, place the placenta in a small jar, pack it all up, put it in the kit. It stays at room temperature. It seals itself. It has a shipping label. Um, and then you just call or fill out a form to get the courier to come and the courier will come and bring it to our lab. Um, so then I will also show videos of our lab. So yeah, I think even like a similar user journey is like egg or sperm freezing. And that's typically like a really um, sort of like vague process to people. Like people don't even know like where their eggs are stored or like how it's stored or what it looks yeah. like. Or Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think like my big vision with this was to just unveil like a lot of what happens. Um, and yeah, so like I visit our lab many times. I always film content when I'm there. I just show people like what it's really like um, so that they feel like a deeper connection to what it is that that they are paying for. Um, and then showing a lot of case studies and using myself as a case study to show like the the real value beyond what they're paying for. That's really interesting. And, you know, um, I'm wondering like outside, outside of just like patients, um, have you guys had any success or considering uh, like educating um, clinicians, midwives, 
Um, so that way, yeah. like, like, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, because, you know, medicine, medicine is a business, no matter where you go in the world, right? And so it, sometimes it helps to incentivize clinicians and say, hey, you know, you should consider like, like being an affiliate selling this product. Have you guys considered that route um, with OBGYNs? Right. Yeah. To, oh, yeah. Tell, tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, OBs, midwives, doulas, um, yeah, pretty much any birth workers. And there, there's so many like unsung heroes with birth too um, that we don't even necessarily work with, but that just like we've spoken with before, like L and D nurses and lactation consultants, and um, even like postpartum therapists. Um, so there are just like so many different people that could potentially touch a birth. Um, so yeah, anyone that, that does, like, I definitely try to spread the word to them. That's why I do podcasts like this because you, yeah, you never know who could be listening and pregnant, even like fundraising for me ended up being like kind of a go-to-market strategy. Cause I ended up pitching like three investors who were expecting, um, and <laughs> yeah, I was only fundraising for like, I think three, three weeks basically for my last round. And um, so yeah, like that was just like really promising. And then they are able to sort of grasp the concept pretty quickly. And especially like people in Silicon Valley, I feel like they tend to be like longevity focused or into biohacking or anything like that. So the idea of like stem cell science and their baby being able to someday help any future family members or the baby themselves is really special. So, um, yeah, the, the concept in Silicon Valley tends to do well. <laughs> That's good. Well, no, and I like I like stuff like this. Um, I, you know, I've spoke about. Uh, there's a couple, of, few guests I've been on my show. We we kind of talked about this, which is, and again, I'm nobody to tell people how to spend their money. But you have like multi multi billionaires out of Silicon Valley, and you know, I think when you achieve a lot of things in life, even as a society, you start chasing death, right? And so, mm -hmm. like, is it cool that I don't know, like Larry Ellison and and others are like finding ways to biohack and like live forever. Like, yeah, sure. You know, but I think there's like so many pathologies and uh, diseases that I think should be worth investing in and making sure that like, Hey, like let's, let's solve these things. So nobody ever has to deal with it. And I think it'd be great to live in a world where um, you have this kind of level of insurance so that God forbid something happens mm -hmm. that you have something to, you know, to fall back on, you know, something that you're like, unfortunately your brother didn't have. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, really sort of random question here. So, uh, patient, patient does this. Oh, I, I kind of skipped over this, by the way, when, with the kit, is the patient expected to do this themselves? Do they hand this to the clinician to do what, what does that workflow look like? Yeah. Typically the, um, the parents just bring it with them. And then you, we recommend looking your physician in the eye and telling them that you want to collect stem cells because physicians and just like hospitals in general, or like birth centers, um, whatever it may be, it, birth is so busy, so they can forget your birth preferences. So that's why we always tell patients, look them in the eye and tell them your birth preferences, even outside of cord blood banking, like whatever it may be that you want to do, I would look them in the eye and tell as many people as you can. Um, and that's involved in your birth. Um, and yeah, basically they just use the tools in the kit. So it is the physician, typically an OB or a nurse. Um, and, but it, it takes only a few minutes and it's not too complicated. Like I would feel comfortable doing it. It's just literally like cutting the cord, putting it in a jar, putting the placenta in a jar. And then to collect the cord blood, you just stick a needle into the cord vein and the vein is actually quite large and it's also yeah, it's a very like, large vein. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see it. Um, so you just stick the needle right in and, um, let it flow. We recommend like milking the cord, um, and let, making sure you can get enough like cord blood volume. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very easy and quite simple. Um, normally if a, if somebody does not bank, um, what happens to the placenta and everything? Does the, does, does the hospital discard it or is there ways? Yeah, yeah. That yeah, it's normally put in a medical waste bin. Some hospitals save them. Sometimes it's sent to pathology if there are specific issues that um, they're wanting to study. Um, it is never sold, which is a common conspiracy theory. Um, so yeah, and then it's basically incinerated as medical waste with like other needles and like gloves and the blue towels you always see in hospitals. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. Um, a couple, couple more things before we kind of uh, wrap up. And again, thanks for coming on the show. I, I, really fascinating company. I was really happy I was able to get you on. Um, yeah. So uh, my wife and I, we have our next kid. 
All right. Mm -hmm. I, I read the Angie kit and I, you know, pay up front, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever I decide to do. And my kid, um, you know, fortunately, both my wife and I, we don't have any like uh, genetic diseases in our family, but like, you know, s something can happen, right? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, my kid turns 20 years old. Mm -hmm. What happens at that point with my, with, 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 with the, you know, cause like at that point it's like, okay, well he's, you know, he or she's been made it to 20. So do we need this? Can we use it for other things? You know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe by the, by, by the time they're 20, I mean, who knows, maybe I'm a, I'm a billionaire and I'm like, man, I'm ready to, I'm ready to figure out how to live forever. You know, like what, what can be done with that, with that, uh, kit, uh, that, uh, um, the cord blood, the, the placenta and, 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 and everything that we're banking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when the baby turns 18, it's their property. So you can, um, choose to continue to store with us. Um, there isn't any evidence so far that elongated cryopreservation periods, um, decays the stem cells. So you can continue to theoretically store for a lifetime. Um, and what's yeah, something but, that can come up uh, like in adulthood though, that, that placenta or cord blood can be used for? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it might even be more usable in adulthood just because disease and, um, disorders can become more prevalent in adulthood. So, um, mm. yeah, it's kind of a variety of things like, um, yeah, cancers, like I said, is the most common use case, typically like leukemias, um, blood disorders like sickle cell anemia. Um, but I think the exciting thing about the space is actually sort of similar to like crypto. Like when I started the company, it there was like the bull market with crypto. So I noticed a lot of parallels in how people were perceiving it specifically in tech. But I think there's this notion with Web3 that like as time moves on, um, like it only becomes increasingly valuable to be a part of like Web3 communities and currencies because um, like Web3 infrastructure can only continue to develop and decentralization will continue to be more beneficial. Um, so like it's it's kind of a stretch, but I feel like if you're in crypto, you you sort of get it. Um, but yeah, but like with with stem cell research, it's like every year there's something coming out that is really revolutionary. Like uh, last year, it was that um, the fifth person ever used cord blood stem cells to be cured of HIV. Um, so there are just like studies like that that are happening all the time. Now it's kind of like stem cell expansion. So being able to take like a very small sample of stem cells and creating like more and more of them and then being able to sort of enhance uh, the treatment or like the dosage and things like that is now what people are very excited about. Um, so yeah, the research just continues to progress. So it's sort of like an investment to store um, stem cells as well, because what is true today with use cases um, will only continue to be more true in 20 years um, and could be like completely revolutionary. That's fascinating. I'm really excited for you. You know, as we kind of wrap up, uh, I want to ask you some sort of fun sort of, uh, um, yeah. it's not fast paced. I've been interviewing all day. Uh, uh, rapid fire, <laughs> that way, not fast yeah. paced. Rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Sure. So uh, first question is, um, you know, the pandemic, you know, we, we, we Amazon Prime, everybody Amazon Prime a lot. And I think that kind of mm -hmm. continued. I feel like during, we had a whole year where that was the only thing that we, that felt good, which is like, oh, we got some Amazon packages, right? Yeah. What's kind of a cool thing that you, bought recently from Amazon or really anything, you know, in the last year or two, like a book, a gadget, anything, anything interesting? Yeah, I've been reading this book called The Female Brain. Um, and it's sort of like a chronological depiction of what the average female brain experiences throughout life. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, like I, I'm at the pregnancy chapter right now. Um, but it even starts like basically like when you're a fetus and into like the first year of life. So they're just a bunch of really interesting factoids. Like for instance, um, baby female brains are able to like be more reactive to emotion and others earlier. So like if a parent um, like doesn't respond to a baby smiling, you can actually see like the reaction in a female baby's brain, even more so than a male baby's brain, because they're able to perceive emotion a little bit earlier in life. Um, and so it actually like there's kind of like this thought that like the, the baby is actually hurt when you don't <laughs> respond to, to emotions that they're displaying. Um, versus like male babies, like might not be as receptive to it. And um, it also talks about why they think that like social disorders or like autism, for instance, could potentially be 
more um, common in men um, and it can be correlated to like high levels of testosterone. So there's just all of these things that, that I think are really interesting. Um, probably another would be my aura ring. I track my sleep, um, and have like gotten, nice. yeah, deeper into like optimizing my own health. So, um, yeah. Fascinating. All right. This is, I, I, I think this is the very first time I'm going to ask this rapid fire question. Mm -hmm. What on average is your HRV? Oh, I actually don't look at that that often. I tend to look at my oh. sleep score the most. I look at my sleep you, score, steps, and heart rate. <laughs> oh, you got to look at the HRV. It's so important. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, you know, what's interesting, I will say is like, um, so I, w I use whoop. Um, oh, and whoop. I would say like, the one skill that I think could solve so many pathologies, illnesses, disease is just yeah. getting better HRV. about sleep. Right, right, right. It's, yeah, it's definitely. crazy. It's crazy. Well, it's good yeah, that that you know, like, uh, you're not, you're not like in your forties or fifties and realizing now, cause it's, yeah. it's it, like sleep is, it's really is a skill. It really is mm -hmm. a skill, you know? Yeah. I listened to the Jay Shetty podcast this morning, um, with an episode on, uh, blue zones, which is like the areas that have the longest lifespans in the world. Um, yeah, so, there's, there's a Netflix series yeah. right now on that too. I'm watching it. Yeah. 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 So they have a podcast episode with the CEO of blue zones. Um, and they basically just talk about like all the patterns that they've noticed in people that that live really long in like the areas that it happens in and um yeah high amount of sleep uh exercise like on average relatively like every 20 minutes um coffee consumption high in antioxidants in the morning um yeah things like that it's so fascinating um yeah, no, I can, I can go on. So I'll, I'll text you. There's another episode, uh, on sleep. I'll, I'll send it to you, but it's really eye opening. Okay, great. Cool. Right, yeah. So okay, you need to find, find out your HRV and let me know. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> I think it's 50, 50 -ish. <laughs> okay, that's good. HRV. That's, that's yeah. really good. Okay. Fantastic. Awesome. All right. Next question. Uh, mentorship's really important when it comes to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being a founder and everything, whether it was one of your VCs or a colleague or something, but in your life, like, What's something that a mentor told you that hurt you? That like it was painful for you to hear, but it changed you. Hmm. Probably that I need to post less modeling photos on Instagram. <laughs> Um, because I used to model when I was younger and like kind of continued throughout 2020 and like early 2021 too. So, um, yeah. And I just like, I love like all things social media. I think that's why I'm passionate about like marketing and I'm able to make so much content for my company. Um, but that also means that I like to make content for myself and yeah, it was, it was a guy that told me that too. And I was kind of like, well, um, like if a guy posted a bunch of pictures in a suit, like nobody would say anything. But, um, but like if a woman posts a lot of photos, even like, even not in things that are like particularly revealing, but just like, like nice outfits, then like all of a sudden they care, they're so vain and like, they care about all these things. And it's like a distraction from my company. Um, and I, I do think like, yeah, that's true to an extent. I think it's true that people perceive that. I don't believe that myself. So it just made me become more wary about um, perception. Cause I think perception is reality. So yeah, it's, um, just something to, to live with. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. I mean, you're right. Perception really is reality. Um, you know, that being said, I think that sometimes one thing that I've learned as I've gotten older is that, um, you kind of kill your own heroes. And mm -hmm. as I've gotten older, there are people that I admire a lot, who I respect a lot, but as I've gotten older, I realize you know what, they're, they're flawed just like me. <laughs> And some of their advice yeah. is actually not good and I don't have to listen to it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think again, for whatever it's worth on my end, I mean, I interview a lot of CEOs and founders and everything. Uh, I, I checked you out on, on different platforms and I actually like that about you because it shows, it shows, it shows some personality shows that, um, it just, it just shows a different aspect to you. Cause like, if I, if I looked you up and all I saw was like, you know, you know, boss girl photos, it's like, Oh, I'm doing CEO <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, you know, that's not you 24 seven, like. You know, yeah. Who is Catherine Car Cross? And again, uh, it, you have a really interesting company, and everything. But I did, I'll be honest, I did do some due diligence on you. And I'm like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> you know what? I would love to have this person on my show. So, you know, whatever. Thanks. Like, I, I, li I like who you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I am private on Instagram, which I never used to be. Um, but not on your Twitter. Twitter, you're not private. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I, I love fashion. Like I, I used to have a fashion podcast and um, 
yeah. So I, that's like why I love to just like express myself through social media in that way. But um, yeah, but I am conscious that like perception is reality. And I think sometimes like yeah. femininity can be a strength too, and like an advantage. So um, totally. yeah, it's just a Oh, no, hundred no, percent, hundred percent. And like, um, I'll actually tell you about it, uh, off, off air, but there's, um, there's actually a group, uh, actually just had their founders on or not, not their founder, their co-chairs on. There's a, an, an amazing group called MedTech women. Um, and they put on a great conference. They have a lot of mentorship and everything. And, uh, I really love what they're doing. Um, but I think, I don't know, you know, I, I struggled my entire career with this concept of like, you know, I'm in a very, you know, like I'm not just even, I'm not in med tech. I, I grew up in medical device, super conservative. And so the industry was very much like, this is how you have to look and act and talk to talk Omar, including like, you know, having a beard. And at some point I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of done with that. I think it's time to change it, you know? So yeah. I'm a big fan, big fan of you. I'm glad that founders like you exist. And <laughs> hopefully I can guarantee you that there's some other founders, probably female founders who are going to listen to this episode. And hopefully you'll, you'll, your words will influence them in a positive way. Um, okay, <laughs> totally, totally. All right. Um, one last uh, question for you is, um, you know, so you mentioned reading. You can't pick the book that you just discussed, by the way. What's a book you feel that you sort of recommend and gift most often to other people and why? Yeah, um, probably Jay Shetty's book, um, Eight Rules to Love. I'm also now reading Think Like a Monk. Um, I just think he's like a really interesting figure um, and the way that he like thinks about life and writes, it's a combination of like self-reflection exercises with like interesting sociology um, and also just like general refle reflections from his own life, um, having been a monk for three years and um, being in a relationship now and kind of like being a coach. Um, I actually don't know if he's a therapist, but he talks a lot about clients um, that he has. So it seems like he's kind of like a quasi therapist. Um, and yeah, I think that they're, they're really reflective. I think to be able to have confidence is to be able to really know yourself. Um, and so doing that time where you're doing a lot of self-reflection to know your own values um, builds confidence within itself. So um, yeah, I recommend that often. Fantastic. I'll have to check it out. I'm very familiar with Jay Shetty. I actually have not listened to his podcast. So you mentioned that oh. they had the CEO of, of Blue Zone. So I'll, I'll listen to that yeah. episode and check out his book. But yeah, I'm very familiar yeah. with him. Like he blew up on the scene, you know? Mm -hmm. for sure. Awesome. Well, hey, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, for those who are interested, they can uh, go check out Anja Health at AnjaHealth.com. I'll leave some links in the comments below for, you know, to follow you. What's the best place for people to connect with you? I know you're on LinkedIn and Twitter, but like where, where do you feel like you engage most with your content? Uh, TikTok. Um, so at Catherine Anja, K A T H R Y N A N J A. Um, yeah, I have around like 160,000 followers and I post every day. I post like our podcast content there um, and like my own stories and things like that. So yeah, I would say TikTok or Instagram too at Anja.health. Um, and if you want to see my fashion Insta content, <laughs> you can find my personal account. <laughs> Sweet. By the way, uh, I didn't mention this, but like, uh, we kind of share that similarity. I actually the very first company I started was like a fashion company It was a fashion oh, inventions cool. company. Yeah. That's yeah. Fashion's a wild world. I'll tell you, like, if you want to see how you're yeah. a master marketer, go do something in fashion. That's it's not easy. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> last thing, uh, go ahead, plug plug your podcast. What's your podcast called? Oh, yeah. Um, Anja Health podcast. Um, so yeah, if you just search Anja Health on like any streaming platform, we are there. Um, and we post content on YouTube, too. And like we chop it up and post it on Instagram and TikTok. So um, yeah, it's pretty much everywhere that you can find Anja Health. But yeah, our whole thing is being like a science oriented birth podcast. So we have like, nice. um, OBs. yeah, OBs, midwives, I think there's just so much misinformation around birth so um yeah oh my god you have seriously that's like the understatement yeah. of the century i'm like yeah. I, I have medical training i was i'm in this industry and when when we we're gonna go through like having our baby and everything like i like i didn't know what to read and where to like it was insane they just search Ange Ange health and then they'll find the podcast correct yeah yeah it's the Ange health podcast colon guide to better birth but if you just search Ange health you'll find us perfect well i'll tell my audience because i always tell them to review the show so go check out uh, their episodes and their podcasts and be sure to give them five stars, write a review and subscribe. Okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>
So awesome. Well, hey, with that being said, thank you all for joining us. Be sure to go check out Catherine and Anja. And this has been another episode of The State of MedTech. I'm your host, Omar Khatib. We'll see you all next time. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of The State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show, or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at katibandco.com. Take care and we'll see you next time.